But first let us take a step backwards for a moment to look at the bigger picture and put this mock terror exercise into context with what was happening in Britain at that time. Tony Blair was in big trouble because he had just been sent a very clear message from the British nation via the May 2005 general election in which he was almost voted out of power that the British people did not want British troops fighting in George Bush's war of terror in the Middle East. So, to be able to keep the British troops fighting in the Middle East, Tony Blair desperately needed something to happen to change the nation's mind. Glen Eagles Tony Blair, George Bush, G8 meeting, agenda of addressing world poverty, forced on them by Live 8 concerts around the world, but not for long. Their lucrative, evil, phony and very unpopular war on terror, which is really a war of terror, will promptly return to the top of the agenda with four big bangs. No time for the poor, the rich have lots more money to make and people to murder. Meredith Hughes, the Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police, based in Sheffield, was also the head of the Association of Chief Police Officers, ACPO, and he was in charge of the policing of the G8 meeting in Glen Eagles on the 7th of July 2005 and played a leading role in the national response to the 7th of July 2005 London bombings. Leeds, where three of the Muslim actors lived and were recruited, and where the oldest, Mohammed Siddiqui Khan, was befriended by the local police and was regularly called upon by them to help them to sort out gang rivalry problems. Mohammed was also taken on a tour of the House of Commons by a Leeds MP who befriended him. The perfect patsy, someone who was made to believe he could trust the authorities and that they would therefore not deceive or harm him, someone who could in turn recruit two other Muslims for the drill so they could all become famous and make a nice bit of clean and easy extra money and show their patriotism by helping the authorities to protect Britain from terrorism. Aylesbury, a fourth Muslim actor who has been recruited, Jermaine Lindsay from Aylesbury, We'll also meet them in Luton. Luton. Transport security firm ICTS, another Israeli company, has an office just a mile away from the Luton train station, which is suspected to be where the Muslim actors received their final instructions before setting off for the train station. The details of which trains to board which carriages to get into, where to sit, and which bus to catch, where to sit on it, and at what time. Another interesting thing about the Israeli firm ICTS is that they also handled the security at the airports in America on 9-11. Commissioner of Police Ian Blair, Rudy Giuliani, Mayor of New York on 9-11, Benjamin Netanyahu, who said 9-11 was good for Israel, Peter Power, and all those taking part in the mock terrorism drill are present in central London, in or around London underground locations where the explosions take place, and also Tavistock Square. ICTS also have their UK head office in Tavistock Square, right next to where the number 30 bus blew up, but more about that later. The four men were supposed to arrive together on time at Luton Station and be caught on CCTV at 07.21.54 a.m. entering the station, but three of them are not on the same video frames as Hasib Hussain 
so have to be inserted later using computer software. Hence the obviously and very badly doctored official single frame time stamped photo that we have been shown from the CCTV outside Luton station. They can't show them moving because it has been faked. That's why they show only one single frame still photo. Why did the authorities have to fake this photo? They would have had to fake it because three of the actors missed the tube trains that they were supposed to catch and which blew up without them being on board. And so there was no video footage from variant systems of them boarding the three tube trains for the authorities to be able to use as false evidence to try to prove to the public that the Muslims were guilty. So they had to doctor and show us the fake photo instead. Hi, this is Flash MP, and this is Flash MP's guide to July 7th CCTV. I'm going to start off with uh, all the things that are wrong with the loot and image, why this is not proof of anything. Certainly, it's not a valuable piece of evidence and would be, not be admissible in court. I'll probably start with the most glaring things that are wrong with the loot and image. Firstly, being Jermaine Lindsay's left leg. There's a lot wrong with this. There's a triangular chunk missing from his left hip and the top of his thigh. It's very unusual and obviously is not normal for a human being and especially at the angle as well. You can also see the top of his thigh is obstructing or is in front of the bottom of his jacket and you should get a clearer view there. You see the top line of his thigh clearly is in front of his jacket and is not underneath like you would expect. Also you can see that there's a lot of merging between the, the plastic bag that he's holding and his right knee. It's generally a very, very messy area and it could be because the people who fabricated this image had, had problems using the original image of Jermaine Lindsay because this is probably composed of a lot of images that were taken on other days, not on July the 7th. And this is why you probably have the problem with the legs because Jermaine Lindsay is obviously holding a plastic bag and they may have only been able to use the the upper body part and not being able to use the legs perhaps because the legs weren't walking in the right direction for this image or they didn't have the right resolution or they may have just not looked right and would have looked even more of a hatchet job than this looks there's a lot of fusion there between his thigh and his right knee between that and the plastic bag there's also a sort of another triangular chunk missing at the bottom where his ankle should be and this again is not normal it's not a normal characteristic for a human being Okay, and on to the next anomaly, which is Mohammed Sadiq Khan's lower left arm, or lack of it. Mohammed Sadiq Khan is the man standing behind Jermaine Lindsay in the white hat. It doesn't appear to have a lower left arm in this image. Some people have said that his arms folded across his stomach or um, is somehow bent behind Jermaine Lindsay. But as you can see um, in both those close-up images, there's no elbow that's visible. And if you look behind, you'll see the glass wall where the reflection should be, or whether that's an authentic reflection is unknown, probably unlikely because there's no left arm there, so it's, it's unlikely that Mohammed Sadiq Khan was standing there on this day. As you can see, there's a glass wall, and it comes down behind, and what you see is Mohammed Sadiq Khan's left arm come down, stopping what is essentially just a straight line. It's just, there's no elbow there at all, and what you'll see behind is the glass wall at Luton Station. And again, this is not really not not normal, not a normal characteristic for a human being and is entirely impossible. Okay, then on to the next anomaly in the Luton image. This is the anomaly associated to Hasib Hussein and this is the dodgy reflection. What you see on the left is Hasib Hussein in the foreground and then this is the background of Hasib Hussein on the right and it essentially looks like someone's taken a stamp or taken the image on the left and tried to stamp it onto the glass wall behind to make it look like a reflection. Again, this is, this is a quite a serious anomaly and it's entirely impossible. Light does not behave in this way and reflections do not behave in this way. You should see a, literally a mirror image of the other side of Hasib Hussein's legs and the right leg should be in front of the left leg in the reflection like this. Okay, then let's move on to the next anomalies in the Luton image. The next anomalies are associated to Shazad Tamweer, who's on the furthest right in the image, in the dark hat. 
there seems to be some sort of impact on the bus stop here. It's very wobbly, it seems to have been disrupted in some way, and that is not present in, or is not the same in the dummy run image, which is taken from supposedly the same camera at the same angle. And as you can see, the, the bus stop is, is a lot straighter, very solid. It's also important to note in the dummy run image that Mohammed Sadiq Khan is wearing the same hat that he's wearing in the Luton image. Also, it's important to note that in the top right-hand corner, there's um, some kind of code, um, perhaps another kind of time and date code, but that's missing from the other image, supposedly July 7th. Also, this image seems to show less of the bus stop than the other image. The police may not be, have been complicit in the falsifying of the Luton image, however, it is quite unlikely, seeing as it was presented in such a way by the police. Okay, then the next image is of Hasib Hussein. This has been used again, like the Luton image, in a lot of media reports, a lot of mainstream media reports, as proof or as um, evidence that the men were in London on July 7th and were able to carry out the bombings. But this image is proof of nothing really. It's, it's, it's unknown where this image was taken. There's no time or date code. The other f three men should be around him, and none of them are visible. This image is really proof of nothing and, and shouldn't be used in any kind of report, mainstream media or not, to substantiate any claims that these men were responsible for the bombing. Also, this uh, image seems to contradict police claims that they travelled together. The question should be asked, why are the police presenting this image as proof? Why are they so eager to put Hasib Hussein and the other men in the frame? And what I was basically trying to show in this video is that even though these images have been used in mainstream media reports, they're really not proof of much, and any report that contains these images is inaccurate, and that issue needs to be addressed. I was also trying to show that the evidence is available, such as the IDs that were found at the scene and the papers that were found at the scene. It's very important if you don't have any CCTV. Of course, some people are going to say that DNA was found at the scene and the papers were found at the scene, and surely that's conclusive proof. It's not impossible to plant DNA at a scene. It's not impossible to plant small fragments of flesh and bone at a scene. It's not difficult. It's definitely not difficult to plant IDs, especially as there are anomalies in in the uh, the way the IDs were found as well. It's not impossible. Why do the images of the three on the right look blurred when compared to Hasib Hussain on the left? Is this a cut and paste leg? Why the extremely blurred face? This technique matches exactly what is known as the smear tool in image manipulation software. Mohammed Siddiqui Khan in the white hat is standing in front of some railings. The top railing partially merges with his face. The middle railing runs behind him, showing that he is in front of it, and the bottom one runs in front of him. How can this be possible? Try doing this yourself while standing straight up with a backpack on. This bar here, going through Khan, you've got, you've got this bar going through his head, okay, and that bar going through his waist. Now, I'll just get down so you can see where... Khan's head would be. It goes right through his face like that, okay? In the famous picture you've all seen. The top railing is waist high, approximately 3 feet 6 inches. So Muhammad Siddiqui Khan would have had to have been a dwarf for the railing to be at his head height, and we know he was not a dwarf. Please note the difference in clarity between the trial run pictures on the 28th of June 2005 and the 7th of July 2005. Please note the difference in the shape of the curb in the two photos. This image has clearly been fabricated, possibly by our intelligence services or police in order to frame these four patsies. Lots of video experts have analysed this Luton Station photo and all agree that it has been fabricated, which is a criminal offence. The fact that it has been fabricated would have any case brought against the alleged bombers thrown out of court and the fabricator arrested for attempting to pervert the course of justice, which as I know from my recent experience, 
carries a maximum life sentence. Remember what Michael Portillo said on the May 2004 BBC Panorama programme. The coverage is going to be organised. So far they are apparently running according to the training exercise plan and on schedule. Fifth chapter title, The Ghost Trains. Unfortunately for the people who have organised the event, the train that the four Muslim actors are supposed to catch, the 0740am train to King's Cross Thameslink, has been cancelled and the next one too, so they cannot possibly make it in time to catch the tube trains that they were supposed to catch as part of the training exercise. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry, as the hand of God interferes. In spite of official confirmation that the 0740 AM train was cancelled and the next one too, the Home Office report still contains the lie that the non-existent 0740 AM train was the one that the four Muslims caught. The authorities have to keep lying about it in order to continue to try to make the public believe that three of the four Muslim men who boarded a train from Luton to King's Cross arrived in time to catch the three tube trains that blew up. In doing so, the authorities make it perfectly clear that the truth of what happened that day is of no importance to them. It is obvious from their actions that the only thing that is important to the authorities is to make us believe what they had already planned to make us believe, even when the facts prove it to be a lie. They even claim to have witnesses on the non-existent train, who they say saw the alleged bombers on the non-existent train. Since then the government has changed its story, claiming that they caught an earlier train and that they have witnesses who also saw them on the earlier train. Really? It is not possible for them to have caught the earlier train, because the CCTV footage times makes it impossible for them to have caught it. If they were really carrying homemade, very volatile explosives in their heavy backpacks, they most certainly would not have been able to risk running to catch a train. The first available train the Muslim actors can catch gets them to King's Cross after the tube trains have already left without them. Hasib Hussein splits off from the other three at King's Cross Thameslink station because he still has time to catch the number 30 bus as his part in the mock terror exercise. When the tube trains they were supposed to catch are blown up, the other three smell a rat and realise they have been duped and are Muslim patsies who will be blamed for the attacks and everyone knows what happened to Lee Harvey Oswald. The Muslims are not from London. Their homes are many miles away, and so they are like fish out of water, and have no idea what to do, or where to go and hide. They realise that they can't go home, and do not know anyone in London whom they can trust. The phones are all not working, first of all because they were jammed, and then shut down by the authorities so they cannot phone anyone to tell them what has happened. What can they do to prevent themselves from being wrongly blamed for the explosions? What would you do in that situation? On one of the early TV news broadcasts that day, a newsreader announced that a report has come in that three of the terrorists involved in the bombings had been shot and killed by the anti-terrorist branch of the police at Canary Wharf in the Docklands area of London's East End. It was also broadcast on BBC Radio 5 Live. The announcement was made only once and never repeated for obvious reasons. 
how could suicide bombers possibly have survived the tube train bombings and then been in the Docklands to be shot? In a New Zealand Herald newspaper article, it says that two people were shot dead outside the HSBC building, and in Canada's Globe and Mail newspaper, only one. There is another newspaper report that the police shot a suicide bomber outside the Credit Suisse First Boston Bank, which is approximately 1,400 feet or 467 yards away from the HSBC building, measured door to door. The two buildings are very different in both shape and size and 467 yards apart and thus they are not easily confused with each other. Police were yesterday probing reports a man had been neutralised outside Canary Wharf. It is believed the man was shot dead by police marksmen outside the Credit Suisse First Boston Bank, South London Press. Tell me, um, the rumours that a police sniper shot dead at the East Side Bomber at Canary Wharf, do you know anything about that? That means that the police shot and killed at least three suicide bombers in Canary Wharf on 7-7-2005. How could suicide bombers, who were supposed to have blown themselves up on the three tube trains, have survived and been shot dead at Canary Wharf? If we have at least three of the four suicide bombers shot dead at Canary Wharf, and we know they weren't on the tube trains that blew up because the 0740 AM train from Luton to King's Cross was cancelled that day, then we have overwhelming proof that they did not blow the tube trains up and that the blowing up of the three tube trains was an inside job. At the Canary Wharf Docklands site, there are media companies for the Muslim patsies to have told their story to and cleared their names if they could. And two possible escape routes via air from the nearby London City Airport that has flights to 34 destinations in the UK and Europe and if they couldn't fly out there was the possibility of getting a boat across the channel to France.